Oh, oh, hi there. Hey, over here. No, 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 over here by the rock collecting bag. No, 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 too far. Too far back, back, back. There. Hi, my name is. Oh, wait. Wait, let, let, me, let me see first if I, I can get, get out of... Whoa! Oops. Just a minute. Just a minute! Oh. Hi there. My name is Chip and I'm a rock hammer. Have you ever seen movies about dinosaurs? Oh, me too. I love the part where they tore into the... Uh, never mind. Did you know the dinosaurs have been gone for over 65 million years? Oh, that's absolutely right. And did you know that there were plants and animals many, many times older than dinosaurs? So, how do we know they existed? Because they left parts of themselves behind, buried in the ground. And the science of studying these ancient plants and animals is called paleontology. The word paleontology comes from... <clears throat> comes from the Greek words paleo, which means old, onto, which means life, and ology, which means study. Or more simply, the study of ancient forms of life. Now cut that out! Okay. Now, I know you want to go exploring, but before you do, you need to understand how paleontologists read the layers of the Earth so that they can keep the fossils they find in some kind of order. What is that? What is that? What? What? <sighs> hmm. Well, think of a fossil as the well-preserved remains of some ancient animal or plant. When I find a fossil buried in the Earth, I ask myself two important questions. Where did this come from, and when did it live? Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> to, to answer this, uh, scientists like paleontologists and geologists ha have developed three tools to help them tell Earth's story. The first tool is called the geologic column. Oh, okay, you can help. <laughs> The geologic column is really just a visual way of thinking about the layers of rocks that have been deposited on the Earth's surface over time. Still not quite clear? Uh, let's see if I can make this easy. Imagine we are building a 100 floor skyscraper. Oh, very nice. And we would build it floor by floor, right? Well, that is how the geologic column is built. Each of these floors represents a layer of Earth that is built or deposited one layer at a time. And by looking at that sequence of layers, we can tell which are the oldest rocks and which are the youngest rocks by using the principle of superposition. No, 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 no. Actually, it's very simple. All it means is that the oldest stuff is usually on the bottom and the youngest stuff is on the top. Look at our skyscraper. You start with building the first floor, then the second, then so on and so on. 
We're on the newest floor, so it would be the youngest, and floor one would be the oldest, way down there on the bottom. That's it. That's the principle of superposition. Whoa. Good. Well, actually, there are many geologic columns all over the world, each one different and each representing the geologic history of that area. Ever look at the ground where it's been cut away for a new building or a new road? Well, that too is part of a geologic column. And when scientists put them all together, they get a pretty good picture of the history of the Earth. These three well-known geologic columns, stacked together, span from the Cambrian period 600 million years ago to the end of the Tertiary period 12 million years ago. These rocks are telling us a story that lasted 588 million years! <laughs> pretty cool! Okay, now that we know the old rocks from the new rocks, how can we tell how old the layers really are in years? Well, that's where the second tool becomes useful. The geologic timeline. So using lots of different dating methods... Uh, not quite. No. Scientists read the time clocks inside the rocks to figure out the age of the layers in a geologic column. And by using these dates, paleontologists can create distinct blocks of time that match the rock layers of the geologic column. And all the blocks of times put together are called the geologic timeline. The timeline starts well over five billion years ago and ends today. To make the timeline easier to work with, it's been divided up into chunks of time. The biggest chunk that paleontologists use is called an era. There are three main eras that each mark big changes in the kind of life that lived on the Earth. And each era has a big, important name! We know the eras begin with the Paleozoic, the dinosaurs lived in the Mesozoic, then finally we see that the Cenozoic continues to this very day. <laughs> Whoa! That was fun! Let's do that again! We know the really old stuff's in the Paleozoic. The dinosaurs fought to the Mesozoic. And lastly, we come to the Cenozoic, where humans continue to stay. All the eras have a name. Life on Earth won't be the same. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> Now, these big eras are divided into even smaller units of time, called periods. Then the periods are divided into even smaller divisions called epochs, and the names of those are... Huh? What? Uh -oh. Well, we won't go over that right now. It's just important that you understand that there are three basic elements of the timeline. The era, the period, and the epoch. So now, if we were to take the timeline, and combine it together with the geologic columns so that they fit perfectly together, we'd find out... Whoa! Well, look at that! Well, we can see now how all the layers of rock fit into the Earth's history. Well, I guess we have the layers in the timeline concept covered. So, what's the third tool that's used by paleontologists to help them determine what age they are exploring? Uh-uh. Oh, not even close! Come on, give it one more guess! That's right! The fossils themselves! But not just any fossils. Only special fossils can help paleontologists figure out what age or period they're exploring, and they are called index fossils. Sure! An index fossil has to have three characteristics. First, it has to be easy to identify. Second, it has to be found in many places all over the world. And third, it has to show clear changes in form over a relatively short period of time. So when a fossil like this is found, it can be used to help date a particular rock layer. Here, take a look at these real ammonite specimens I found. One is from the Cretaceous period, about 80 million years ago. And the other one lived during the Jurassic period, about 200 million years ago. While they may look similar in their general shape, they're different enough to help paleontologists date specific rock layers. See how the geologic column, the timeline, 
and index fossils all work together to help paleontologists organize fossils and determine their relative age, not their absolute age. Well, there are actually two different kinds of time paleontologists work with, relative time and absolute time. Now, absolute time uses specific dating techniques, which read the time clocks inside rocks to date the age of rocks in years. Absolute time tries to be as exact as possible. For example, if you have a baseball or soccer game this month, absolute time would tell you it is on Saturday, July 20th at 2.30 p.m. in the afternoon. Relative time would tell you your game is in July, but it's not that exact, and you'd probably miss the game. Relative time doesn't worry about exact dates. It describes the larger order or sequence of things. Think of the entire existence of the Earth squeezed into only one year. Look, life doesn't appear until April. Look, there are trilobites stretching through November. Wow, dinosaurs by mid-December. They're all gone now, and it's only a few days later. Relative time is good for putting events, or large periods of time, into some kind of order, usually from oldest to youngest, like the geologic column and timeline we were talking about earlier. It's sometimes very helpful to look at huge clumps of time using measurements we understand. Personally, I find it really hard to get a good grasp of something that may cover millions of years! <laughs> Okay, I know you're anxious to start exploring for fossils, but first I think it might be a good idea to learn how they're formed and, and where to look for them. As I said earlier, a fossil is the preserved remains of an ancient animal or plant. No, not peach preserves! <laughs> but it can be something left behind by ancient animals like burrows or droppings or, or footprints. These are called trace fossils. Tell you what, let's take a look at some real fossils. Now here's a fossil of a fish from Wyoming that is around 50 million years old. And this fish is 300 million years old. This one is a 64 million year old ammonite from England. These shells from the tertiary period are four and a half million years old. And this trilobite is upside down. Uh, just a minute. Just a minute. Uh, oh. There! It comes from the Devonian period, about 380 million years ago. Off we go. Actually, it's not that easy to become a fossil. Or the Earth would be littered with old dead stuff like leaves and trees and animals and... Whoa! <laughs> uh, to, to be preserved, it really helps if an animal has hard parts like a skeleton or an exoskeleton. Uh, like this trilobite? <laughs> Trilobites lived on Earth for well over 300 million years. But they were all gone long before the time of the dinosaurs. We still know about them from the fossils they left behind. It takes just the right conditions to become a fossil. That means getting buried very quickly in fine sediments so the plant or animal remains don't have time to be eaten or to be exposed to the destructive forces of wind, water, and bacteria. Once the organism is buried, there are a number of ways it can be preserved as a fossil. One method of preservation, which is very common, is called mold and cast. Here, a trilobite falls into sediment and is completely covered. Water dissolves the trilobite away, leaving a cavity in the hardening sediment. The walls of this cavity become the mold, other sediments and minerals fill this cavity and then harden to create a duplicate of the trilobite. Here is the mold on this side, and the cast is on this side, which has a shape just like the original trilobite. Huh. The next type of fossil preservation is called petrification. Petrification occurs when additional minerals that are dissolved in water are deposited in the pores or microscopic holes in material like wood, bone, or even shells. Here's an example of petrified wood that was found in Calistoga, California. The last kind of fossil preservation is called 
carbonization. Soft-bodied creatures like worms and parts of plants, such as leaves, stems, and seeds, can be preserved in this way when they fall into and are covered by fine mud and other sediments. Carbonization is a chemical process that acts on an organism using bacteria, pressure, and heat. It chemically changes the original material, plant or animal, into a thin carbon film. This is an example of a carbonized worm called Nema vermes mackey. It was found in Illinois, inside a round and smooth piece of shale called a concretion, and is about 300 million years old. Huh. Now, while these methods of preservation are different, they actually hint at what type of rock is most likely to contain fossils. <laughs> you bet. There are three basic types of rock. Igneous rock forms as molten magma hardens inside the earth. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Metamorphic rock is formed from other rocks that are put under heat and pressure inside the earth. And finally, sedimentary rock, which is formed by the layering of various types of sediment. Okay, you, Mr. Drawing Board Person! Yes, you! Well, which rock type would most likely preserve fossils? You're right! 99% of the world's fossils are found in sedimentary rock. Sandstone, siltstone, shale, and limestone are great places to look for fossils. Now that we've learned how paleontology